Thank you for this help. Uh, have you tried some <coughs> tools uh, using a pseudo element like uh, Callisto or Alvin? They might be better at yeah, the resolving the, these problems. The idea behind this story was to look at what was being done and analyze the main bulk of the literature. And I haven't shown, but uh, in the study, we found that over 85% of the articles were doing genome alignments. So we went for genome alignment as a first step of analysis because that's what is being done the most. But yes, there are important tools also to quantify and to uh, benchmark. I think we'll move on. Thank you, Joya. So the next talk will be from Jasleen Grewal from uh, at the uh, at Canada's uh, Michael Smith Genome Center's uh, Science Center in Canada. And uh, Jasleen will be talking about learning biological meaningful uh, representation of cancer transcriptomes with uh, hierarchical variational bays. You have to switch to um, full screen instead. So if you want to move. Hello, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to come and talk about my work here. So our lab uh, at the University of British Columbia and BC Cancer is primarily focused on cancer genomics and um, dissecting the biology of advanced cancers in particular um, using next-gen sequencing data. Uh, and so uh, I, in particular, focus on using transcriptomes to try and understand how rare cancers occur, especially in the setting of uh, post-treatment, uh, where their biology might have changed significantly from back when they started out as primary cancers instead. Uh, so when I say uh, transcriptomic data, what I really mean is bulk RNA, um, generally poly selected, and that's sort of what dominates the field of analysis in, in cancer biology. Um, and you can use that data for very different types of analyses. So you could do um, just use the gene expression values for um, classification of different types of cancers. Um, you can try and figure out whether there are certain markers for certain responses to the therapy, or if there's any predictive um, value in um, certain markers and um, sensitivity to certain drugs down the road instead. Um, and typically, for all of these analyses, some point in the road, you will have to do some sort of gene selection. So RNA-seq gives you about 50,000 genes um, in, if you're doing total RNA sequencing, um, but not all of those genes are fully representative of the biological signal in the bulk tissue, um, as previously foreshadowed by Joel as well. There's a lot of stuff going on from the initial experiment to when we actually get the, the final count data and the RPKM data, the TPM data, whichever we choose to work with. Um, so there's a lot of this extra non-biological source of variability that are confounding interpretation. And for the most part, we don't have to worry about them because um, if we choose our gene sets correctly and if we're looking at um, really well-characterized cancers, then we have really good leads to follow. But like I mentioned, I uh, work in the domain of rare cancers instead, um, and especially in the cases where the biology might not be fully characterized for certain cancers. So you can't really just plug and play um, the, the, the old school techniques um, of uh, curated gene sets or statistical, statistically high um, genes uh, for your analysis. Uh, so one of the important things in there is that um, is for a lot of these rare cancers, because there's so few of them, um, and oftentimes uh, the, the method of how they form and how they're maintained within the tissue are not really clear, um, because there are no clear markers that send out. Um, and part of that is, again, because we have very few examples to actually make any inferences off of. Um, but it's also hypothesized for certain ones of these um, that there are diffuse patterns of pathogenesis for these cancers, so there aren't really any clear driver mutations or driver expression markers um, that are responsible for these cancers instead. And that becomes really difficult to study when we're actually kicking out, uh, throwing out a bunch of our data because it's, over, over, it's overshadowed by all the noise instead. So we started at that point, and our idea was that really all that biological and non-biological source of variability are, in a way, prior hidden processes um, that we can't really see, but are influencing what we observe in terms of the gene expression data. So if we model that in the Bayesian world, what we really have is a prior, and we're trying to use what we know about existing cancers and healthy tissues. So these are all primary cancers that have been sequenced, um, healthy tissues that have also been sequenced. So we're trying to use those gene expression profiles to really update that prior and have a model that is able to learn from that prior and say, now I've figured out what are all the biological signals that can potentially exist in this data, and there might be some consistent patterns corresponding to non-technical -techni sources of variability instead. Um, since we want this model to also be usable for analysis of those rare cancers, like I mentioned, um, an algorithm that lends itself quite nicely for that is variational autoencoders. So for those of you not really familiar with the setup, uh, an autoencoder is a neural network that tries to compress um, an input into a smaller representation and then tries to decode it, and that's what you're optimizing. 
in a variational autoencoder, things are a bit different. So it's really, we're just using that autoencoder setup as a scaffold, but it's more in the space of um, Bayesian stats where you're trying to say, well, my data, all your data you're seeing your training is coming from some sort of prior process. So try to learn what that prior really is, um, and then at the same time optimize for the, for the decoding instead as well. Uh, what a lot of people do when we're using variational autoencoders is that a lot of times a Gaussian assumption is quite sufficient um, to, to, to try and optimize this model for your particular question. But what we, we found quite early on in our, in our uh, questioning in this realm was we were trying to train this system on very different types of cancers and very different types of healthy tissues as well. So a Gaussian assumption was just not enough. So there was all this structure within the data that we already knew of. So we decided to go in a very non-parametric direction instead with our prior. Um, so uh, building up on work from uh, Prasoon Goel et al. Uh, from Carnegie Mellon and, um, and its publication in 2017, uh, we decided to go with this non-parametric hierarchical prior, which just builds a tree um, as the prior instead. So now, when you're building that latent representation, you're choosing a path along this tree, and that's what you're sampling to generate that latent encoding for a given sample. So what that means intuitively is that you're already ensuring that the network, in a way, is learning where that sample sits in a hierarchy in this hidden space. So again, you're sort of Im imbuing it with the sense of logic that you already have about your data. All right, so um, what that means also, though, is that the training is not just um, optimizing for that prior and um, optimizing for the reconstruction. You have to spend an extra step at every epoch of training to try and uh, prune that uh, tree. So you start with a random tree initialize, and then it'll iteratively try and add, add and remove certain nodes until it's happy that it's managed to capture all of what's going on in your training data as well. And in order to make sure that we don't get uh, too carried away with our training, uh, we use the GTEC data samples. So those are all the healthy normal tissues. There's about 5,000 samples that we use as a validation set. So that's just more as a control to make sure that we don't overtrain our system here. But now when we've done all of that and we've selected an ideal model based on the log likelihood and the other uh, assessment scores, we end up getting uh, outputs that are the encodings, so the latent space, and then you get the decodings of the data as well. So now uh, we could say, well, what's going on in the encoded space? So do they preserve the biological properties? And if they do, that's good. Um, but what we found more interesting was we've now taken whole transcriptomes of very different biological processes, and we've tried to train this model to say, here's the entire transcriptome, and here's what's really characteristic of that transcriptome, and here's what is not really char characteristic of the transcriptome. So if you look at the data as a whole, are there certain genes that this model has a really easy time learning, and are there certain ones that it's just like, has no idea what to do with? Um, so quickly going back to the encodings, um, so what we did was took the average encoding for every TCGA category, put it into hierarchical clustering, and then what we were able to reassure ourselves of was that broad biological trends were really captured quite immediately um, based off of that clustering instead. So the primary cancers cluster together and the normal tissues cluster together. But again, what we found more interesting was looking at that decoding space, so how well the genes are being uh, recapitulated by this model in a mathematical formulation, so to speak. So uh, the metric that we used in order to calculate that uh, was the absolute coefficient of variation uh, for a given gene across all samples in the input space as well as in the decoding space, so those are calculated separately. Um, we power transform across all the genes to make that be equivalent to almost a score-ish for every gene uh, in the input as well as the decoding. And then you can make a composite score out of those two values um, into what we call the infidelity metric. So if the infidelity metric is really low, then a gene was learned really, really well. And if it's really high, then the gene was not learned well by the model at all. So now if we group them based on the broad RNA species that we're all well aware of, uh, what we find is that the protein coding genes, particularly the subset of the cancer tumor suppressors and can cancer oncogenes, have relatively lower infidelity metrics than do um, all the long and non-short coding, uh, uh, non-coding RNA species instead. And I'm preaching to the choir, but we all know that poly selected RNA um, really does not do a good job at capturing a lot of these species instead. Um, if you look a bit more closely at the ends over here, so what are the genes that are lying towards the extremities? So the ones that are not learned well at all and the ones that are learned really, really well. Uh, we can group them by further gene families instead based off of biomart annotations. Um, and what we find up at the top here, these are all the poorly learned genes. Uh, while a lot of them are these non-coding RNAs shown in blue, in black you have all the protein coding gene families instead. So we were really surprised to see those come up as well as being something that are not really um, tractable by based on what the model has been trying to learn about the system. So uh, we're still trying to make sense of what that really means. Um, it's interesting that defensins pop, it, pop up and keratin associated proteins pop up. There's some literature on how these are really difficult to map to, um, but there's only like one or two papers on them uh, so far. So if anybody has any insights, please come talk to me after. Um, 
But in summary, what we've shown here is that um, we can actually use a model like variational autoencoder to actually capture the diversity of transcriptomes in different cancers. Uh, what we've also shown with our uh, infidelity metric is a way to do gene selection almost, so where you can prioritize certain genes that are more characteristic for your data set or for your cohort, um, and use that to identify further uh, families or candidates um, that might not really be worthy of analysis, so to speak, um, uh, if you're using poly-selected RNA-seq uh, data uh, for, for your um, cancer transcriptomes and so forth. Uh, but what we find most fascinating about the system now is that it's almost tried to try its best at learning what cancer transcriptomes do and how genes interact in known and unknown ways, almost. So you can use it as a perturbation model and say, well, now if I blank a gene in the input, what happens in the decoding instead? Are there certain genes that are really easy uh, to predict in the inputs nevertheless? Or are there certain genes that are impacted if a gene is missing in the input? So how does that in an entire interaction work? So that's something that we can map out using this technique quite intuitively. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my lab, uh, especially Dr. Stephen Jones and all the former and current members of the lab that have contributed to this work, um, and especially to ISMB uh, and to CIHR back in Canada for all the travel support in getting me here. And I'll take any questions. Quick question. So in the genes that are hard to learn, uh, can you find characteristics do they have something in common? Like, are they highly structured or...? Um, you mean... So, uh, one of the things that we did find was like the non, uh, not short and long, long non-coding RNAs instead. Uh, one of the things that's crossed my mind uh, while I've been here at the, the conference sessions here um, is the potential role of isoforms uh, in potentially adding more variability to the prediction instead, because those are not curated properly, and the way that we're doing the pileups on them are not really the most ideal. So that might be accounting for the variability as well, and that's something we're going to try and investigate further. But so far, we don't really have any leads on what might be driving a lot of those predictions as well. Yep. Oh, yep. um, so have you tried to look for outliers, which is another type of application for this in clinical setting, where you would try to infer what the profile should be, and then things that are really not well inferred could be things, of, things that are breaking for diagnosis, for example. Yeah, so that's really the idea with once we have the system set up and it's really just learned everything about primary cancers and their perturbations and that kind of landscape, now we can go into the clinic and look at these metastatic cancers instead and say, well, what are the things that we should expect to be recapitulated quite well now, but are not in this cancer instead? And that's one of the applications that we're hoping to use this for down the road, but we haven't done that yet. Right. Thank you, Jessely. Yeah.